What would it be like if we paid for food like we do healthcare? What's in the news with stories on Happy Birthday Bitcoin, Cody Wilson Update, Shutdown News, Government Spying, and Warmongers? And an Ask Me Anything where I answer questions on what's wrong with the LP, crypto predictions, and crypto anonymity. This episode is brought to you by Zencash, now known as Horizon, a cryptocurrency that infuses privacy, anonymity, and security done right. Also brought to you by SmartCash, an easy-to-use, fast, and secure cryptocurrency that supports everyday use for everyday transactions. Welcome to The Lava Flow, channeling the flow of information to the libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and agorist community. Find us at thelavaflow.com. Here's your host, Roger Paxton. Thank you for joining me this week. From the state that has only four states smaller than it in size, this is the show that will bring you the people, places, and events that everyone in the Liberty Rebellion needs to know. You can catch me on Twitter at the Lava Flow Pod. This is episode 117, Buy Food Like Healthcare. And it's Tuesday, January 22nd, 2018, when there have already been more than 45 people killed by police this year. And the United States debt clock shows us at more than $21,952,200,000,000 in debt. What's wrestling my jimmies this week? You're about to find out. Let's do it to it. First of all, I want to apologize for the last couple of weeks with no episodes. Between traveling, getting sick twice in a row, and another short mini vacation to the water park, which was part of my boy's Christmas presents, I have been swamped. But I'm back in action now, so all is well. But thank you for your patience. On to the show. In my normal perusing of the interwebs for content for this show, I came across an article at fee.org by the Foundation for Economic Education. This article is titled, Imagine If We Paid for Food Like We Do Healthcare. It was written by Dr. Ryan Nofel. And damn, guys, this is a really, really good article. It's so good, in fact, that I don't want my listeners to miss this one. So I'm going to do something that I rarely ever do. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever done it in 117 episodes of The Lava Flow and almost 60 lava spurts. I am going to take this article basically verbatim and read it here. So here we go. An Affordable Food Plan You enter the grocery store parking lot at 4.15 p.m., having taken off work early because this particular store closes at 5 p.m. This food market wasn't your personal preference based on quality, service, amenities, and price. You chose it, like all of your previous food choices, because it was included in your new food management plans network. Thankfully, your new Green Cross Green Shield, GCGS, bronze select food plan is a benefit provided by your new employer. There is some payroll deduction stuff that you don't quite understand yet. Most of the plan's $680 monthly premium is hidden from you and drastically reduces your wages. Still, you're happy that your food plan costs only, as far as you know, $123 per paycheck. Despite not being particularly pleased with any of your previous food plans, you always try to take full advantage of the tax-preferred option of buying groceries and eating out as the plan allows. After all, you and most Americans haven't known a different way of eating in your lifetimes. This is how you've purchased food since your parents' employer's food plan stopped covering you at age 26. Food Mart's entrance is not easy to find, but you finally make your way into the store. You're first greeted by a few women sitting behind a glass-enclosed desk. By greeted, I mean they ask you for your photo ID and food plan card and hand you a clipboard with a stack of forms to complete. The lobby is crowded but you manage to find a seat amid the sea of inpatient shoppers. You've completed these types of forms dozens of times previously, but you dutifully do so again. You still prefer 2% milk, don't like more than four vegetables, and your peanut allergy is unchanged. Forms completed, you check back in with the receptionist. After 20 minutes of waiting, she assigns you a cart, and you start to shop with your list in hand. Worried that you won't be able to afford everything on your list, you cross off any specialty items and opt only for the basics. As you scurry up and down the aisles, you see there are no prices listed on anything. 
nor labels telling you what is a bronze select item. You suspect the delicatessen with your favorite cheeses is off limits because of the large, included with United Food Platinum Plus sign above it that is no mention of Green Cross Green Shield. Remembering that eggs are included as a free GCSGS wellness benefit, you get three dozen of those, even though you really don't need any right now. During checkout, the cashier rings up the items and asks you for a $30 copay. You're given a six-page receipt with indecipherable codes and then asked to sign a few other forms, because some of your items will be billed to you later. As you drive home, you remember that your monthly food deductible is $250, and you hope that the balance of the bill isn't overly expensive. Several months in the future, you get a bill for $276 for Food Mart. Although vaguely suspicious that you've been taken advantage of somehow, you're happy that you got a big discount on your $18 box of Tasty Flake cereal and have now reached your deductible. Overall, your experience with Food Mart was confusing, but you remain thankful that you have access to food through your GCGS plan. Some of your self-employed friends are much worse off. Rising Costs the next day, in the mood for tamales, you decide to treat yourself to a Mexican restaurant nearby that you've heard is great. The last time you attempted homemade tamales, it was a disaster, so you leave this to professionals from now on. Upon arrival, you are saddened to learn that Lola's Casina is not part of your GCGS plan. You decide to go down the street to Burrito King, which prominently displays proud-to-accept GCGS Bronze Select members in its window. They don't serve tamales, but you are determined to stay in network for lunch. After waiting a while to be seated, the waiter takes your order. He seems distracted, and you hope he heard the order correctly. Eventually, a lukewarm burrito arrives at your table. You rush to finish it so you can get back to work on time. Upon checkout, you present the waiter your GCGS card, and you are asked to pay a $10 copay. The billing statement weeks later reveals that the plan discount did reduce the initial charge from $64 to $37, and that GCGS paid Burrito King another $27 a few months later, which was applied to your deductible. You question how a simple burrito can cost $37, but nobody, including the majority of food policy experts, knows exactly why. Given the escalating prices and dysfunction of the food industry in recent decades, everyone has their favorite boogeyman to blame for these high costs. Bob, the burrito shop owner, food management companies, Big Tortilla, technology, various political parties, government in action, and of course the fact that profiting from food is legal. Although many burrito makers and food management companies are designated as not-for-profit. But it's actually quite logical. Burrito King, a small restaurant, employs four cashiers out front and seven people in their business office, in addition to the usual staff to cook and serve food. Their head chef, Bob, spends much of his time completing forms to justify why the deluxe burrito you ordered included black beans instead of the standard pinto. He is burned out and ready to quit altogether. All of these hoops drastically increase the difficulty and costs of business, necessitating higher revenues and prices. And Burrito King didn't bill you or your plan $64 because they are greedy. They contract with dozens of different food plans that have different contracted rates for each item determined annually by contract. To simplify their billing, they must choose a universal charge master rate that is many magnitudes above what any food plan has agreed to pay them. Nobody, except for people without a food plan, will ever actually pay the charge master rate. You might ask, if Green Cross Green Shield is paying the bills, why don't they rein in the cost of Tasty Flakes and burritos? Well, they actually make more money when food prices are high. Government Intervention Regardless of your favorite scapegoat, most people can agree that having a good food management plan has become increasingly important. It is technically possible to buy a food plan on the private market, but the vast majority of people take whatever their employer offers. The government bestowed a big tax break on employer-purchased food plans a few generations ago. However, now even employers are struggling to absorb the inflation of food plan premiums. They have started to shift more of these costs to employees, 
increasing both your payroll deduction each month and your out-of-pocket costs every time you actually need to eat. Gone are the days of good food plans with $5 copays and $50 deductibles. If you're wondering why the federal government hasn't intervened to fix this, they have, repeatedly. A couple of generations ago, federal and state governments created a myriad of food management programs for various vulnerable populations, including the elderly and the poor. These food management plans function much like private plans, usually administered by the same companies, and are the largest purchasers of food in the nation. But their budgets have swelled to unsustainable levels. To fix this, the government has cut rates paid to food suppliers. In reaction, many food stores and restaurants are opting out of these programs altogether, greatly limiting the choices of where poor and elderly Americans can purchase food or eat. A few decades ago, Congress granted the Private American Food Association, the AFA, an already powerful private organization of food suppliers, the authority to set the relative value, price paid, of each food item through a complex coding system. The AFA committee that determines pricing for federal programs has widespread impact, and most private food plans follow the same formulas. Predictably, the AFA value committee has become a source of cronyism that favors certain players in the food industry. Despite decades of government interventions, many have still struggled to afford food. So, several years ago, Congress passed the Affordable Sustenance Act, also known as ASA, or Obama Food. The goals of this plan were numerous, but the main gist was to expand programs for low-income people, subsidize private food plans, modern-income people on food.gov, and create a legal mandate for all Americans to purchase a qualified food plan. After a few years of national political disputes, including whether free-range pork should be a standard food plan benefit, the ASA's mandates were eventually imposed. The ASA has increased the number of people with food plans, from 86% to 92%, but hasn't much alternated the trajectory of escalating food prices. Our national spending on food now stands at nearly 20% of GDP, and those without subsidies continue to be burdened by high costs. Not surprisingly, Green Cross, Green Shield, and other private food management companies, being middlemen for most of the money Americans spend on food, have continued to make healthy profits regardless. Dwindling Choices You're probably thinking, this is stupid. Nobody would stand for this. And I'll just go back to using Costco, CSAs, Whole Foods, or Blue Apron for my groceries. Open Table and Uber Eats will allow me to seamlessly order food from my favorite restaurants. I'm sorry to inform you that those companies, services, and technologies do not exist in a world where we purchase food like this. The growing power of food plans and government has had a profound impact on the grocery store and restaurant industries. Food vendors' operations are entirely geared around servicing intermediaries, not their customers. Innovation to improve quality and reduce costs is decades behind other industries. Food suppliers of all types have consolidated, and large food conglomerates, such as McWalby's, have thrived. Politicians, regardless of their ideology and grandstanding, are lobbied heavily by a swamp of power players to preserve the status quo. Understandably, most Americans are fed up with all of this, and an increasing number now believe the only solution is a nationally, federally administered, single food plan. This dystopia won't be easy to fix, but don't despair. There is a sliver of hope. In recent years, there has been a small but growing underground movement bypassing this Byzantine food management, managed healthcare, system. These rebel grocers and chefs, independent doctors, are directly providing their customers, patients, with quality, affordable food and meals, medical care. What's in the news? The news you need to know from a libertarian perspective. In happy birthday news, on January 3rd, Bitcoin reached its 10th birthday marking 10 years since the creation of the Genesis block on the Bitcoin blockchain. Whereas Bitcoin's theoretical foundations were laid with the publication of the Bitcoin white paper on October 31, 2008, January 3, 2009 heralds the first practical implementation of the world's first cryptocurrency, 
the realization of a peer-to-peer and cryptographically secure system for transacting in digital cash. As data from the Bitcoin Block Explorer tool indicates, Block Zero, counted as Block One in very early versions of the blockchain, was mined on January 3, 2009 at 1.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with a reward of 50 BTC. Today, that reward will be worth about $191,000, but at the time, its value was inestimable. Bitcoin's first-ever recorded trading price was noted on March 17, 2010, a year later, on the now-defunct trading platform at BitcoinMarket.com at a value of .003 cents. As I write this week's episode, the price of a single Bitcoin is around $3,600, way down from its highest of $19,800 in December of 2017, but still higher than it was in September of 2017. It's been a rough 13 months for cryptocurrencies across the board, but I am still personally all in on cryptocurrencies. I'm as bullish today as I ever was, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. In a Cody Wilson update, Texas has indicted Cody Wilson on multiple counts of sexual assault of a minor. More than three months have passed since a warrant initially went out for defense distributed founder Cody Wilson's arrest. That document detailed Wilson's alleged sexual assault against a female child younger than 17 years of age, whom he reportedly solicited through the website SugarDaddyMeat.com. On December 28th, the state of Texas finally formally indicted Wilson. The 3D printed gun advocate now faces multiple charges, four counts of sexual assault of a child, two charges of indecency with a child by contact, and two charges of indecency with a child by exposure. These charges are all second-degree felonies, punishable by up to 20 years in prison and fines of up to $10,000 each. One of Wilson's attorneys, F. and Dino Raynaud, said, Mr. Wilson, at all times, believed reasonably that the complaining witness was a consenting adult. We are confident that once all of the facts are out and we have a chance to interface with the DA's office more directly, that we'll be able to resolve this matter. For now, Wilson remains out of jail on a $150,000 bond, though he is being monitored, as evidenced by a motion to travel out of state, granted by the courts for the winter holidays. As for his former company, the defense distributed founder has been formally removed as a director, according to its public information report filed with the Texas Comptroller's Office. The PIR for the related organization Ghost Gunner Incorporated has yet to be updated for 2018 and still lists Wilson as a director. Now look, this is all a bunch of trumped-up bullshit. Cody went to a website that was for adults only. As a matter of fact, to create an account on the site, sugardaddymeat.com, you have to say you're 18 or older. He had every reason to believe he was dealing with a consenting adult, and absolutely no way to know that he wasn't. Is he supposed to card his dates now? Are we all? And let's be clear, if this had happened in Arkansas or Oklahoma, two states that literally border Texas and have a consenting age law that is 16, just one year lower than the Texas law at 17, this would not have been an issue at all legally. Zencash has changed their name to Horizon to better represent their transition from a pure cryptocurrency to a pioneering platform that protects consumer data. They're focusing more on the wider vision of what Zencash was all about. The new name, Horizon, reinforces that the project is forward-thinking and visionary and will broaden the horizons of what the community can accomplish in the world using the platform. Not only is it one of the best privacy-oriented cryptocurrencies with zero-knowledge technology built into it, but they also have private chat over their network. And soon, Horizon will include the ability to publish information and go anywhere on the web, all with complete privacy. They are working toward the day when anyone will be able to build privacy-based applications on the Horizon platform and generate income from them. This will allow Horizon to bring thousands of real-life services to the community. Services that provide freedom, utility, and privacy. The unique spelling of Horizon is a nod to their heritage and recognizes that they remain committed to the vision that their project was built upon. Their coin and ticker symbol remains Zen. So Zencash is now Horizon, and Horizon is bringing privacy to life. You can learn more at horizon.global. That's H-O-R-I-Z-E-N dot global. In shutdown news, private companies have been paying to keep Yellowstone National Park clean during the shutdown. 
Several weeks under the government shutdown, some of America's national parks are starting to get a bit rank. Access is free, since there are no employees to collect the typical $35 per vehicle entrance fees. But that comes with a trade-off of there being no employees to empty trash bins or clean toilets either. But at Yellowstone National Park, National Public Radio reports, local businesses are chipping in to make sure the bathrooms get cleaned, the roads get plowed, and the tourists keep coming. Even in the middle of winter, the park gets an estimated 20,000 visitors per month, and those hardy folks want to rent snowmobiles, hire tour guides, and take sightseeing trips. The private sector businesses that thrive on these tourist dollars have a pretty strong incentive to make sure Yellowstone remains accessible. Zantera Parks and Resorts, which runs the only hotels inside Yellowstone that remain open during the winter, is leading the effort to cover the $7,500 daily tab for keeping the roads plowed and the snowmobile trails groomed during the shutdown. Thirteen other private businesses that offer tours of the park are chipping in $300 a day to help cover that expense as well. Meanwhile, Zantera has some of its own employees assigned to clean park bathrooms during the shutdown, and snowmobile tour guides are packing their own toilet paper for customers to use. In all, it seems like a pretty straightforward lesson about how private businesses will respond to changing market conditions and incentives. While some of the business owners profiled by NPR suggest they're chipping in to keep the park open due to altruistic concerns, it should be open and services should be there because it is the people's park, says one. The bottom line is likely still the bottom line. Keeping the park accessible means those businesses can continue to profit off of the tourists, government shutdown or not. In Wasted Taxpayer Dollars news, San Bernardino County has agreed to pay nearly $400,000 to three former middle schoolers to settle a lawsuit stemming from a 2013 arrest a federal court ruled unconstitutional. San Bernardino County Deputy Luis Ortiz decided the students he was speaking to about alleged bullying weren't taking him seriously enough. So he handcuffed, arrested, and drove three 7th grade girls from Etiwanda Intermediate School to the police station to, quote, teach the girls a lesson. Nothing about this was legal, of course, but the county decided to defend this all the way to the appellate level. The Ninth Circuit Court said, Deputy Ortiz clearly stated that the justification for the arrests was not the commission of a crime, since he did not care who was at fault, nor the school's special need to maintain campus safety, but rather his own desire to prove a point and make the students mature a lot faster. The arrest of a middle schooler, however, cannot be justified as a scare tactic, a lesson in maturity, or a chastisement for perceived disrespect. Deputy Ortiz faced a room of seven seated, mostly quiet middle school girls and only generalized allegations of fighting and conflict amongst them. Even accounting for what Deputy Ortiz perceived to be non-responsiveness to his questioning, the full-scale arrests of all seven students, without further inquiry, was both excessively intrusive in light of the girls' young ages and not reasonably related to the school's expressed need. Now, this outcome was all but assured the moment that Ortiz decided to start teaching students lessons by performing unconstitutional arrests. The county's decision to fight the district court's ruling doesn't reflect well on it or its legal representation. Somehow, the county thought that if it just litigated hard enough, it would somehow talk a court into agreeing law enforcement can arrest people just to teach them a lesson. Even when those someones were teens who committed no crime, and posed no safety threat to the school or the idiotic law enforcement officer that did it hired. And now, the taxpayers of the county have to shell out $400,000 to the arrested kid. Who is being taught a lesson here? Not the kids he was trying to scare, that's for sure. And I assure you, neither the cop nor the county bureaucrats learned a lesson either. I also imagine the taxpayers in the county didn't learn anything, too. Smart Cash is an easy-to-use, fast, and secure cryptocurrency that supports everyday use for everyday transactions. Smart Cash is focused on getting the currency back into cryptocurrency, and their vision is to replace centralized fiat currencies in day-to-day -day life. Too many cryptos talk about being used as a currency, but they are all focused on something else and leave user experience for both merchant and customer by the wayside. 
SmartCash is focused on being used for business payments and POS through such features like their Instant Pay, which allows for trusted transactions in a second, powered and secured by their 20,000 user-run smart nodes. SmartCash also has a Smart Hive proposal system that is funded by the blockchain, where any user can put forth a project proposal to expand the community, ecosystem, or technology. Holding one smart equals one vote, so all users can participate in voting without having to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to run a full node. The people working on Smart Cash are broken up into six different Smart Hive structuring teams with dedicated team members that are completely funded by the blockchain. There is no CEO, no foundation, no centralized leadership, and there is no need for outside investors to come in and compromise any deals. Check out Smart Cash today at thelavaflow.com slash smart to find out how they are putting the cash into Smart Cash and the currency into cryptocurrency. I believe this is truly a ground floor opportunity to get in on a rising tide. Get a wallet and find an exchange to purchase Smart Cash at thelavaflow.com slash smart. In government spying news, the ACLU has sued the U.S. government, saying that it needs more information about surveillance of Americans' phone and financial records to guide the public debate over what will happen when the law that regulates the scrutiny expires next year. They sued the National Security Agency, the Director of National Intelligence, the CIA, and the Justice Department in Manhattan Federal Court, seeking information about a program that collects records during investigations into terrorism or clandestine intelligence activities. According to the lawsuit, the government has not responded to requests made last month for information about its surveillance of Americans under a 2015 law. Congress used the law to set boundaries on the NSA's bulk collection of call records and other data after former NSA contractor and world hero Edward Snowden leaked documents revealing extensive government surveillance. The law requires annual reports to Congress from the intelligence community and forces the government to seek a court order to collect call records to obtain intelligence. Requests of records of U.S. citizens for investigations cannot be based solely on activities protected by the First Amendment. The lawsuit, the ACLU added, is necessary because the public lacks adequate information about how the government collects vast numbers of Americans' communications records, financial records, and other data without a warrant. It said the law was meant to curtail unnecessary surveillance, but data collection continues to occur on an immense scale. For instance, the lawsuit noted, the government said it collected over 534 million call detail records in 2017, even though it reported having only 40 surveillance targets. Even the government can't believe that we are stupid enough to believe that 40 people made 534 million calls in 2017, right? Unless maybe they were all teenage girls. In Warmonger's news, U.S. Strategic Command, the unified military force that controls the launch of nuclear weapons, tweeted an unusual New Year's Eve message featuring B-2 bombers dropping 30,000-pound conventional weapons at a test range. The tweet from U.S. Strategic Command's official account said, Hashtag Times Square tradition rings in the hashtag New Year by dropping the big ball. If ever needed, we are hashtag ready to drop something much, much bigger. What the actual fuck? The post, later deleted, included a sizzle reel initially released earlier this year showing a B-2 bomber dropping a pair of conventional massive ordnance penetrators at a test range. A Strategic Command spokesperson, Navy Captain Brooke DeWalt, told CNN that the post is part of our recap of command priorities— and it's all about reassuring the American people that the U.S. military is ready at all times, even on New Year's Eve. Later that day, Strategic Command tweeted, Our previous NYE tweet was in poor taste and does not reflect our values. We apologize. We are dedicated to the security of America and its allies. But that's exactly the problem here. It's just this kind of tweet that exactly reflects the, their values. Fuck warmongers like the Strategic Command in the neck with a pair of conventional massive ordnance penetrators. Exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per episode donation of as little as a buck an episode. Or use Bitcoin. Get exclusive content, rewards, and help the lava flow become fiscally neutral while providing you more content. 
thelavaflow.com slash support. Ask me anything. Roger will answer your questions about, well, anything. Do you have a question for Roger? Email AMA at thelavaflow.com or add your question to the latest AMA thread in the Pax Libertas Productions Facebook group. Now, this is becoming perhaps my favorite segment on this show because I love hearing from my listeners and supporters. Supporter Isaac C. asks, what do you think is currently wrong with the Libertarian Party, and what would you do to fix it? To put it simply, Isaac, the LP's biggest issue is that they think they can win elections, period. And they have abandoned the main purpose of the Libertarian Party, which was to educate the masses and not try to achieve electoral success. In my opinion, the only way we will ever achieve the freedom we desire is through education, not elections. Look, the LP has a love of shiny things, namely people like Bob Barr, Gary Johnson, and Bill O.G. Libertarian Weld. As long as the body of the LP puts men like this above the principles of libertarianism just to try to win elections, the LP will never do anything to advance the cause of liberty. At this point, my belief is that the LP is useless at anything except giving a handful of baby libertarians a place to find real libertarianism. This only happens to a few, sadly. Most baby libertarians go back to being conservatives or libertarians when they realize the LP is not going to win elections. However, a few stubborn baby libertarians, such as myself, have used the LP as a jumping-off point to find true, non-violent, peaceful solutions to our problems. Thanks so much for the question, Isaac. Supporter Bronson R. asks, I think the headlines are ready for a Roger Paxton BTC price prediction for 2018 and 2019. Lambos or Daewoo's? <laughs> I mean, this question is perfect for this month, the 10th anniversary of the Genesis block of Bitcoin. I have to say first that you must take any prediction from anyone with a huge grain of salt. No one has the knowledge needed to make an accurate prediction on this topic, least of all me. I will say, though, that I am still all in on cryptocurrency. I use it often, and I'm holding as much as I can. Now, if you look historically, the price will rise eventually. I have no way of knowing when or how much it will rise, but I am confident that it will one day rise. But, like I always say, make sure that you only put as much money in crypto as you can comfortably lose. While I think investing in crypto is a good investment for the future, it could go to nothing as well. It's not very likely at all, but it is certainly possible. So do I think it will be Lamborghinis or Daewoo's for 2019? I think I'll split the difference. I think it will be Tesla's for 2019. Or at least I hope so. Thanks for the question. Supporter Terry T. asks, I'm having trouble comprehending anonymity when it comes to crypto. I can't say I understand the blockchain, but I trust intelligent people who say that transferring crypto wallet to wallet is difficult to trace. I don't understand what is anonymous about providing a government ID to obtain a wallet. I'm certain that banks notify the government of how much fiat I transfer to an exchange platform. The government may not know my activity after creating my wallet, but they will have me on their list of people to harass. I bought a $25 prepaid Visa card as an attempt to transfer fiat to my Uphold wallet, but Uphold requires 3D secure Visa cards. I doubt any gift card is made 3D secure. I have an Uphold wallet because of Helium. I know Coinbase shares info with the IRS. Is there a different exchange wallet you suggest? You're free to answer this on your Ask Me Anything segment. Thanks, and Happy New Year. Terry, Happy New Year to you as well, first of all, and thanks for this question. Yes, you are correct that if you buy or hold crypto in an exchange wallet such as Uphold or Coinbase, then you are subject to laws and taxation. This is simply because for these companies to legally exist, they have to cooperate with authorities and follow certain laws. The sad reality is that if they didn't, our rulers would send men with guns to shut those companies down. I use Coinbase myself sometimes. I even use them as an affiliate for the Lava Flow. So if you want to buy crypto easily, using them is a good bet. You can use my affiliate code at thelavaflow.com slash Coinbase, and if you buy $100 or more in crypto, then you and I both get a free $10 in crypto. For newbies or people who are not as technical, this is a good alternative to get into crypto. However, if you're very serious about anonymity and the government having no information on your crypto holdings, I do not recommend that you keep your money in an exchange. 
I recommend you use a wallet where you have the keys and you have control 100%. These are wallets that you can keep on your cell phone, on your computer, on a piece of paper even, or even a hardware wallet. Now, some of the phone and computer wallets I recommend are the Bitcoin.com wallet, which allows you to hold Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash, the Coinomi wallet, which allows you to hold up to 70 different cryptos, and the Edge wallet, which allows you to hold dozens. For hardware wallets, I recommend anything by Ledger or Trezor. The trick, though, is buying crypto without the government's knowledge. I mean, there are ways to do this, though. You can go to a site called localbitcoins.com and buy Bitcoin in face-to-face transactions from people using the site. You can also find someone who will accept PayPal for crypto. Perhaps the easiest, though, is to find a crypto ATM in your area. You can go to sites like coinatmradar.com and others to find ATMs local to you. There are also escrow sites like Wall of Coins and BitQuick that allow you to purchase crypto from people remotely. While it is possible to do this, it is still, as you can see, a bit tricky. It depends on how much your privacy matters to you as to how far you'll go. The government knows almost nothing about the extent of my crypto holdings, and I plan to keep it that way. I highly suggest you do the same. Thanks so much for the question, Terry. And remember, guys, if you have a question for me, you can email ama at thelavaflow.com, ask in one of the AMA threads on either the Pax Libertas Productions Facebook group or the Lava Flow Supporters Secret Facebook group, or you can even ask through Patreon. Questions from my supporters are always answered first. Thank you for listening to the show this week. As always, I need to thank my favorite Southerner, Jessica, for her help with the show. For the show notes to this episode where I put links and other information that's been on this show, go to thelavaflow.com slash 117. I have two new supporters through Bitbacker using crypto and one through Patreon this week. Smart Cash creators became a $1 per month donor using Smart Cash through Bitbacker. Thank you so much. And Zaphoid became a $5 per month donor using Smart Cash through Bitbacker. Awesome, Zaphoid. Thank you so much. Welcome aboard. And Steve B. became a $2.50 supporter through Patreon. Thank you so much, Steve. That is a huge help. So thanks to Smart Cash creators, Zaphoid, Steve B., and all of my awesome supporters, I am at $252.50 per episode, or 50.5% of the way towards my next goal of $500 per episode. Guys, thank you all so much for your support, really. However, as you can tell, this is the lowest I've been in a long time. A lot of that is because of the Patreon issue. But guys, please remember, pulling your support from me hurts me way more than it hurts Patreon. Patreon gets about 3% of your money, where I get about 90-92% to of it. Also, there's always a dip during and after the holidays. But remember, when I hit this next goal, I will be upping the content I bring you from half an hour per week to a full hour. I know you want more content from me, and I want to give it to you, so add your pledge today to help me bring you twice the lava flow that you're getting today. So exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per-episode donation of as little as a buck an episode using Federal Reserve notes through Patreon or monthly using Subscribestar or using cryptocurrencies through Bitbacker. I want to be able to bring you more content soon, so make sure to add your donation today to help make that happen. I also have a new Apple podcast review. Hippie Deathwish said, Love the show. Thank you, Roger, for giving this recovering minarchist a fresh perspective on voluntarism. You have a great gift for presenting your principles in such a way that mental barriers fostered by statists don't stand a chance. Recovering minarchist. I love it, Hippie. Thank you so much for that solid review, man. And if you have a minute and you want to hear your review read right here on the show, please go to lavaflow.com slash apple and leave me a rating and a review. All the cool kids are doing it. Thank you to everyone who's left me a rating and a review so far. You guys rock. To all of you who haven't, can you guys help me out and go leave a review for me? Go to thelavaflow.com slash apple to do that now. Until next time, keep striking the root. Thank you for listening to The Lava Flow at thelavaflow.com. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe now at thelavaflow.com forward slash subscribe. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast.